All right, welcome to the Restoration Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Brother Ned Hairston, pastor here at Restoration Church of Christ. We meet every Wednesday night at 5 p.m. California time to study the Word of God. We've been going through the book of Exodus for the past few weeks. We're currently in Exodus chapter 32. And if you've been following along with us, you know that this is uh, the time when Moses comes down from the mountain after he's received the plan for building the tabernacle from God himself. And he knows exactly how to build the tent. Of course, he didn't leave us a very detailed plan, so we don't know how to build the tent. But we get a nice description of it, nevertheless. But now in 32, he's going to come down from the mountain and he's going to find a people that have broken their promises. So I'm going to warn you that chapter 32 is very graphic. There's violence. There's, um, well, it, it's a very graphic um, chapter. So if you if you don't think you've signed up for that and reading the Bible, well, it's the Bible. What did you expect? But, but also just uh, you might want to skip this chapter. So with that out of the way, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods which shall go before us. And I'm told that the reason that this is translated gods, right? The word in Hebrew is Elohim. It's the same word that's used for God. And it's always translated God. But the word is always plural. So the reason that it's translated in the plural here is because the verb, which would be go, is also plural. So they have to agree, right? So that's how we know that they are saying gods and not make us a god. So they say, come make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, take off the golden rings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. Now, notice, they're worried for Moses' sake, but not one of them is going to approach that mountain. They're afraid that Moses has just disappeared. But they heard God speak from the mountain, and they're not about to approach it. So this comes from a place of fear, right? This reaction comes from a place of fear, of anxiety, of what does the future hold? All of our leaders went up there to the mountain, and they're gone. As far as we know, they're gone. Aaron, do something. And Aaron wastes no time, right? It doesn't tell us that he fights back at all. He just goes about his business. He's a priest. He does what priests do. But this isn't what priests do in verse 3. It says, All the people took off their golden rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He received what they handed him, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it into a molded calf. Now remember in the tabernacle how God had told Moses, now have these curtains made and have them be the work of an embroiderer and have these engravings done and have them be the work of an engraver, right? Get all the people together and have them do what they're good at. That's how you honor God. But Aaron, well, he's not honoring God. And he isn't doing what he's good at. Aaron is a priest. Now he's making an idol. And priests don't make idols, right? In the, in the vision that we have for the tabernacle, those are things that are done by skilled hands. The priest's skill 
lies in knowing what is lawful, knowing how to do the rituals and how to do them properly and how to interpret those things. Those are Aaron's skills. This is not. So he makes the molded calf. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now here, your Bible says the Lord, but it uses the name of God. So your, your Bible may say, um, instead of the Lord, it may say Yahweh or Jehovah, and that's because Aaron has used the name of the Lord in worshiping this idol. So not only have they made an idol, they've abandoned God, they've made an idol, they have worshipped the idol, and they've taken the, na the, the Lord's name in vain. So they commit three, three sins right off the bat. They rose up early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. The Lord spoke to Moses, go get down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned away quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Remember when Moses was going up to the mountain, he made them promise not to do this very thing. He made them promise to be faithful for all the Ten Commandments. He declared what the commandments were in, in, in chapter 20. Right? He declared them to Israel and he said, now you're going to keep all these, right? I'm going to go up this mountain and you're going to be good, right? Yeah, we'll do it. And he did this whole elaborate song and dance. He made them promise over and over, you're going to do this, right? Well, here they've broken their promise. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses. Actually, if you're still wondering, did they break the commandment, I am the Lord your God? Right? Did they break that first commandment? It's a very strange commandment to break. But here it is when they say, these are your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When they make their idol, it is no longer the Lord their God. Right? They are no longer serving the Lord their God. And so they break that first commandment. So then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and behold, they are a stiff necked people. Now, the Bible often gives us, especially in the Old Testament, um, visually descriptive imagery, uh, visually descriptive phrases like this, a stiff-necked people. And you might imagine trying to lead a mule, right? You have it harnessed and you're trying to lead it and you want it to go to the right or you want it to go, go to the left. And it keeps its neck stiff. It won't move to the right or to the left because it has an idea. The mule has an idea in its head. It's going to go this way and you can't change its mind. <sighs> so God says, these are a stiff necked people. They are stubborn. You can pull and pull and pull and they just won't go. Now, therefore, Leave me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. 
So here, God gives Moses the same promise he gave to Abraham. Just, just wait, I will make you a great nation. But it's not the same promise that he gave to Abraham, is it? Because God is saying, leave me alone so that I can be angry. He didn't do that with Abraham. Have you ever experienced that kind of anger? I think the most common type would be when you're driving, right? Leave me alone so that I can be angry. In fact, I think the car was just made for this because when someone pisses you off on the road, you are alone. There's no one else in that car and you get angry at them and you're alone. So you just get more and more angry because you have nothing else to think about, right? You're just sitting there stewing in your anger. And by the time you get out of the car, you're just super angry over something that was really, really small. It's almost like cars were made for that kind of anger. You might get angry at someone and think, you know, if I just had five minutes to work this out with this person, we could just five minutes of talking, we'd have this worked out. But you're too angry for that. So you go and be alone and you get more angry. And if you're lucky, you'll have enough time to burn that out before you see them again. But God says to Moses, leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I will destroy them. So God is going to stew in his anger, but he's left Moses out here. He gives Moses the tyrant's dream, by the way. Just let me destroy them and I'll make of you a great nation. They will all be little clones of you. You know? What tyrant doesn't want that? But Moses isn't a tyrant. Moses is actually a good leader, and here's what proves it. Moses begged the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people that you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians talk, saying he brought them out for evil to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the surface of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and turn away from this evil against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the sky, and all this land that I have spoken of I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. Moses argues with God. And here's the amazing thing. Not only does he argue with God, but in verse 14, so the Lord turned away from the evil which he had said he would do to his people. Not only does Moses argue with God, but he changes God's mind. In a sense, Moses is being a leader to God, right? He is, he's being the kind of leader that listens, the kind of leader who leads with his heart. And not only does he have to do that for his people, but he has to do it for his boss, That's why Moses is in charge, because he can do that. Something about verse 14 made me deeply uncomfortable when I first read it. And it's because Abraham said to God that, God, anything you say you can do, you can do. And it was 
it, that is Abraham's statement of faith. God, anything you can do, anything you say you can do, you can do. Here, God is saying that he will do something evil. Well, the Torah here tells us that God can do evil. And this is something that goes against um, St. Augustine's idea of the omni-God, that God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is omnibenevolent. Um, so God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. And I believe there were two more, and they've completely slipped my mind. But here we have an example in which God is not all-good. At least his actions are not all good. But every time we see this in the Torah, when God does something evil, it is always in direct response to human evil. In this case, God is planning something evil because the nation of Israel has worshipped another God. Right? They have broken their promise they have worshipped another god. They have done great evil. And so God is planning something evil in response. When we see God doing these things, we can be sure that he is trying to correct human evil. We don't have, unlike, well, unlike us, it is not God's nature to do evil. In fact, throughout the prophets, we see a God that is just incapable of understanding why we are capable of such evil. He is deeply hurt by it. He mourns it. It is not in his nature, and he doesn't understand it. So, the Lord turned away from the evil which he said he would do to his people. Now, the Torah also says of evil that it is in the human heart. But notice that when evil is placed in the Lord's hands here, you know, it's placed on God, it simply said that he he would do it. He said he would do it, but it is not in his heart to, to do it, right? When we do evil, the Torah tells us that it comes from our hearts. But here, when God is saying he will do evil, it doesn't use the same language. There's something very different about these two types of evil. Oh, okay. Verse 14 is it, it is deep in its meaning and we're just going to move on from it because honestly we could talk about this all night if you have other observations for this please type them into the chat and we can come back to this but i'm just going to move on for now so verse 15 moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, tablets that were written on both their sides. They were written on one side and on the other. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen plenty of depictions of the Ten Commandments on two tablets. I've never seen a depiction of them where you would have to turn them over to read the other side. You know, if you think about like the controversial tablets that have been hanging up in courthouses, they're always hung on a wall and you can read all 10 of them there and they're numbered, right? When we studied the commandments in Exodus chapter 20, one of the problematic things about studying them was just numbering them because there are 13 statements that must be condensed into 10 commandments. How do you number them? The Torah also tells us there are 10 of them. So we must number them just in order to have them. 
Well, they were written on one side and the other. Verse 16, the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is the noise of war in the camp. He said, it isn't the voice of those who shout for victory. It is not the voice of those who cry for being overcome, but the noise of those who sing that I hear. As soon as he came near to the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing then Moses' anger grew hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. Now, why does he do this? Now, he's angry. But Moses doesn't just carelessly throw the tablets. He does it. He, he knows before he goes down what it is he's going to see. God already told him. What he's doing is deliberate. He throws the tablets down, showing that they have broken the covenant. They themselves have broken the covenant that these tablets represent. And I've lost my place. Excuse me. As soon as he came near to the camp. Oh, there I was. Okay. Verse 20. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire, ground it to powder, and scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink it. Now, I'm not sure about the details of this, because... You don't burn gold down to a powder. And that tells me that this gold isn't pure, right? It, it has to be overlaid on top of something. But they did make it from earrings and jewelry. So maybe there's not that much of it. Who knows? But somehow it burns down to a powder. And that would be the case if it were overlaid over paper or wood, right? Now Moses takes this powder and mixes it with water. And this is similar to what we get in Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 through 31. In that passage, we're given a test for faithfulness, right? If a husband, and I'll give you the, um, I'll give you the summary of it from, from verse 29. This is the law for cases of jealousy, when a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself, or when jealous feelings come over a man and he becomes suspicious of his wife, then he must have the woman stand before the Lord and the priest will carry out all this law upon her. Then the man will be free from iniquity, but that woman will bear the consequences of her iniquity. And the thing is, is if you read that whole passage, you can see it's a test. It's not, um, you know, we're going to have a fair trial and then there's going to be a hanging. It's a fair test, um, you know, as fair as any supernatural test ever gets. But this is exactly what Moses is doing. He makes them drink of these ashes in the water as a test of their faithfulness to God. So this, by the way, this, um, this law in Numbers chapter 5, there is no archaeological evidence that this was ever carried out. It very well be made, it very well be meant to simply reflect this passage in the scripture and not be something that is meant to be taken literally. Oh yeah, if you're worried that your wife is cheating, have her drink ashes in water and take her before the priest. 
I don't think it's meant to be taken literally so much as it is to reflect on this passage and explain it further and maybe even to explain the emotion of this passage in a way that's more clear. Verse 21, Moses said to Aaron, what did the people do to you that you have brought a great sin on them? Aaron said, don't let the anger of my Lord grow hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. So Aaron's role in making this calf is actually quite a bit more lazy than we were led to believe by the previous description, right? He says he just threw it in the fire and this is the shape it came out in. <laughs> so it's probably a very ugly object. Like when you, you know, look at, um, when you look at the walls and you see patterns, you know, like, oh, that over there in the bricks, it looks kind of like a dog, you know? And he pulls this puddle of gold out and it looks kind of like a calf. You know, he's not only an unskilled artisan, he's pretty lazy about it as well. So verse 25, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them lose control, causing derision among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. He said to them, the Lord, the God of Israel says, every man put his sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp and every man kill his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. The sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. Now, this begs the question, did God tell Moses to do this? Notice that the Torah has no problem repeating itself, right? Aaron just repeated himself. He just repeated what the people of Israel told him just earlier in the chapter. All right, Moses repeats himself, but here we get something new. Moses said, ah, this is from the Lord. But God didn't previously say this to Moses. In fact, if we go all the way back up the mountain and say, all right, what did God actually say to Moses? He said that he was going to wipe out all of Israel. Now Moses is doing it. But when he went down the mountain, it was after convincing God not to do this. Now in his anger, he's going to do it. But he has tested them to find out who is guilty and he has called on them to rededicate themselves to God. In fact, everyone in the camp could go over to Moses' side. There need not be anyone left out. They could all dedicate themselves to forgiveness. Instead, Moses decides to remove from the census all of the people who are not loyal to God. Only those who are willing to kill their brother, their companion, their neighbor in the name of the Lord 
will remain after this. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. About 3,000 men fell of the people that day. Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, for every man was against his son and against his brother, that he may give you a blessing today. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I shall make atonement for your sin. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made themselves gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out of your book, which you have written. Moses is taking responsibility for their sins. He took responsibility for their punishment. Because that's what leaders do. Verse 33, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. The Lord struck the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. Now, in another translation I read earlier today, it said that God struck them with a plague. Um, I think I still have that up here, chapter 32. Let's see if there's a note on that as to why these two differ. Footnote. Nope. So, no footnote as to why these two translations differ. Um, well, that's bothersome, isn't it? All right. Chapter 33. Um, the Lord spoke to Moses, depart, go up from here. You and the people that you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your offspring. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusites. Go to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up amongst you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you on the way. So God is still angry, clearly. He's still going to give them the land, and he is still expecting to go into the land before them, that they may simply go into it. Verse 4, when the people heard this evil news, they mourned, and no one put on his jewelry. The Lord had said to Moses, tell the children of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go up amongst you for one moment, I would consume you. Therefore, now take off your jewelry from you that I may know what to do to you. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? Take off your jewelry that I may know what to do to you. In other words, he's asking them to not show up in their Sunday best, but to show that they are mourning, that they are wanting forgiveness for what they have done. If they show up in, with their jewelry in their Sunday best, then it's just another day. Then they have nothing to be sorry for. 
He's asking them to show up in plain clothes without makeup. In a posture of mourning. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their jewelry from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used, used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far away from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. When Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose up and stood, everyone at their tent door, and watched Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered into the tent, the pillar of cloud descended, stood at the tent, at the door of the tent, and the Lord spoke with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the door of the tent, and all the people rose up and worshipped everyone at their tent door. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. He turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, didn't depart from the tent. Now, this is interesting because it tells us that Moses and God are meeting face to face. But in the very next passage that we're going to read, it tells us that Moses doesn't see God face to face. In other words, God is there, but Moses doesn't really see him. He's seeing the pillar of cloud. In other words, God is still obscured to him. All right, verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, behold, you tell me, bring up this people and you haven't let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in your sight, or excuse me, in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your way now that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with me, don't carry us up from here. For how would people know that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, isn't it that you go with us so that we are separated, I and your people, from all the people who are on the surface of the earth? In other words, people know that we are yours because you are with us, right? When, when we finish worship on Sunday and we're praying that final prayer, I always pray that the Spirit of God goes with us, that people may see the Spirit of God in us. And this is what Moses is saying. They know, people know that we are your children because you are with us. They see the things that God brings about in us, and they know. So verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So this is contrasting what came before, isn't it? Moses speaks to God as a friend, but God has largely rejected the people of Israel because of their unfaithfulness. He's still angry at them, and he can't go through the land with them because he's so angry at them. Moses pleads with him in his meetings with God and God says, fine, I'll do it, but I'm doing this for you. Moses said in verse 18, please show me your glory. 
He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and you will proclaim the Lord's name before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He said, you cannot see my face for man may not see me and live. The Lord also said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock. It will happen while my glory passes by that I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face shall, but my face shall not be seen. <clears throat> so this is a strange phrase. It's as strange a phrase in Hebrew as it is in English, right? God says, no one may look on me and live. And yet that's exactly what Moses does. But it's like a technicality. Moses is looking at the back of God, not the front of God. It's weird, isn't it? And it's even weirder in Hebrew because back is plural in Hebrew. The backs of God. Huh? I was reading earlier that one rabbi speculated that because God is spirit, that the meaning of this, that you don't really see a spirit, but you see the effect of it, right? In Hebrew, spirit is ruach, but that word is also breath or wind. You don't see God just like you don't see the wind. You see what it leaves behind, all right? You, you know that there is wind because the trees move. You know that there is wind because it moves the dust on the ground. And so whatever the effect is of God's presence, Moses is seeing the after effect of that, of God being fully there and then being fully absent. So we still have a little time, but I don't think we're going to get through a whole chapter in that time. So we'll finish up here in chapter 33. Next week, we will pick up chapter 34 with the chiseling of the revised and uh, the uh, new volume of the Ten Commandments on their stone tablets. Uh, once again, I would remind you that this is the Restoration Church of Christ Bible Study. We meet every Wednesday night at 5 o'clock California time to study the Word of God. Next week, we'll be starting Exodus chapter 34. So until then, may the peace of God be with you always.